Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And so great to be back in person. Um, so, you know, we're, we're here today to talk about the future of really public transit and the role that public transit will play in, you know, post pandemic world. And, um, and, and I'll start off with a quote that, you know, actually comes from the LA Metro vision for 2028. It's a 10 year plan. And I thought it really, you know, kind of sets the stage really well for why public transit is important to begin with. Um, the quote is, Better mobility results uh, provide greater access and opportunities for all, including jobs, education, housing, and healthcare, essential elements for a quality of life. And, you know, I think when we talk about mobility and, and public transit in particular, it's kind of easy to lose sight of why we are, you know, kind of focused on operationalizing, you know, service improvements or things of the sort. But it really is at the end of the day about quality of life. For people that grew up in, you know, in, in cities, um, I'm a. I grew up in LA, uh, in the Valley, and I remember, uh, you know, thinking about the the sort of, you know, summer resources that I had access to in the summer camps that I could go to based on, um, you know, walking distance, what was available to me, which in LA can can be limited sometimes. But I'm excited to hear from Joshua. Uh, you know, about some of the really cool work that LA Metro has been doing to, you know, create um, on-demand, uh, you know, service rides for uh, Los Angelinos and, you know, some of the supportive private sector tools that Optibus and uh, AWS is also providing for cities that are, you know, looking to provide smart solutions for the future of transit. So, um, you know, just to, to start, we'll do some intros and we'll hear from each of our panelists uh, about, you know, what they do and we'll dig into what are some of the practical solutions that we're seeing that are working in getting people back on the bus, as the title says. So with that, I'll first introduce Joshua Shank, Joshua Shank who is the Chief Innovation Officer of LA Metro. Josh, can you tell us a little bit, Joshua, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, sure. So the uh, the Office of Extraordinary Innovation, which was created six years ago uh, at LA Metro, has essentially two main purposes. One is that we do the strategic planning. So Vision 2028 that you read was uh, an effort that was led by our office. Uh, it sets the 10 year vision for what Metro hopes to accomplish. And then the second thing is we do partnerships with the private sector on innovative technologies and also innovative financing um, to help try to uh, accomplish the very goals that we helped outline in Vision 2028, but perhaps more efficiently and more effectively than we have in the past. Great. We also have uh, Kevin Foreman, who's the general manager of Optibus North America. Kevin, tell us a little bit about your work. Super, thanks for having me here. Uh, maybe just a quick show of hands. How many of you have ever heard of Optibus? Okay, maybe a third of the crowd. Super, thank you. That's great news. Um, we're a five-year-old software company uh, at engineering in Tel Aviv, uh, offices throughout North America, and we do fixed route so maybe the non-exciting part of the, of the session here, fixed route, planning and scheduling and rostering. And we license our software to transit agencies who are trying to increase ridership, drive more efficiency, and they operate in 500 cities around the globe from as small as uh, Marin County, I think, just north of San Francisco to as large as Transport for London and Singapore. So great to be here. Looking forward to hearing your questions as well. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And lastly, we have Ravi Tellery, um, who is a Principal Solutions Architect at AWS. Ravi, tell us about your work. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ravi Tillery, Principal Solution Architect for uh, AWS for the Small and Local Government Transportation Vertical within um, AWS, also known as Amazon Web Services. Uh, for the uninitiated, AWS is a cloud services company. And within this context, cloud computing refers to the on-demand delivery of IT resources uh, with the click of a button um, uh, with on-demand pricing. Um, we actively work with customers, um, agencies that are actively, that recognize the power of cloud computing and are looking to move things and people uh, equitably, efficiently, reliably, and in a post-pandemic world, safely. Great. In fact, we're, we're a customer of AWS, by yep. the way. So there we go. Get a great customer of AWS. <laughs> Plug for him there for us. So really what we want to get to today are, again, practical things that are working or are not working to improving public transit as a service and to, you know, making it a competitive uh, tool in the landscape of, you know, mobility. So uh, we'll begin with, you know, just cutting through the noise and maybe just hearing from each of you about something that's worked. What's a product 
or a you know new project that you've deployed that you've seen um, you know post pandemic is addressing the needs of commuters or riders in getting to where they need to go. Yeah, so I mean, I think the first thing, uh, and you know, because I'm because I'm the innovation guy, I kind of have to start by saying that you know, questioning the the goal that we put out there of of do, is the goal to uh, put people more people back on transit post pandemic, or is the goal to address the core issues of mobility and equity and sustainability that are the heart of why we want to get people on transit, right? And so, of course, obviously, I'm pushing for the latter. And if that is the goal, then part of getting people back and achieving the goals of mobility, equity, and environmental outcomes is actually expanding your options beyond traditional transit so that you can provide a kind of universal basic mobility for people who don't have access to vehicles. And that's kind of been where we've been thinking in the innovation office and at Metro is, can we, and we are doing this, can we create a mobility wallet and the technical tool that allows people to have the flexibility to use their transportation budget, whether it's their own money on the case of people who can afford it, or whether it's money that is provided to them on the case of people who can't, for whatever option suits them best. Because if you've been in Los Angeles at all, you know that there is certainly no one size fits all when it comes to uh, alternatives to driving alone. There are many, many ways to get around here. And if we just focused on transit, we'd be missing half of those ways and the things that connect to transit. So transit is a tool for achieving those goals, but it's not the only tool. And when we create this mobility wallet, which we're, we're currently working with our partners uh, at TAP within, within Metro and then in the city of Los Angeles, to create this mobility wallet that enables people to select the options and combination of options that work for them, I think that's how we get to the recovery goals that we really care about. Great. Um... Kevin, what what have you seen, you know, maybe within the bounds of Optibus, any features that you see your clients or agencies across the U.S., um, you know, using to better provide services in this sure. pandemic world? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think there's sort of good news in this pandemic. Um, we've had to become much more efficient, sort of representing sort of all the transit agencies and look at replacing some of the sins of the past when you could just be lazy and not look for inefficiencies. A lot of our licensees hadn't changed routes for 20 years and changing routes is hard. There's an equity issue, there's a political issue, they're very political, but to be able to run multiple scenarios and have the excuse, I'll use that word on purpose, of a pandemic and having to, have allowed us to become much more efficient. And I'm really pleased of all of our transit agency licensees from LADOT to Anaheim, Disney shut down, right? And this is Anaheim, they're a licensee of ours, talk about panic but it allows you to sort of go on a diet. And when you come back, you're just much healthier. And I'm, I'm not one to talk about being on a diet, but I think what I, so we see across all of our licensees is flexibility. The, the number one thing that they've now had is flexibility. Flexibility to run multiple scenarios for a service delivery change. Flexibility to understand what, what EV buses being introduced, what transit deserts with on-demand systems to actually try to provide as much ridership, as much equity as possible, given a certain budget. And it's really fascinating. We're finding these legacy systems have millions of dollars of loose change in the cushions. And wouldn't we all love to find millions of dollars of loose change from Youngstown, Ohio? We were just out in Youngstown. And in literally 15 days, when they implemented our system, they found a million dollars of inefficiency that they could either provide more service or EV buses or on demand or scooters or bikes, or I'm sure all of you have a wish list of what you would have spend a million dollars on. So that's a long-winded answer to saying flexibility is one of the things that we've seen our agencies. There used to be this notion of we only produce four schedules a year. And now as you're trying to match the demand going down through COVID and back up through COVID, there's a notion that we can actually produce faster service changes to match more the demand from ridership. And ridership is coming back different in Seattle than it is in LA versus Sheboygan based on a bunch of things from gas prices to unemployment and to give people the flexibility to run multiple schedules to pick the right schedule and then implement a new schedule a month later and not have to live with it is probably the number one win that we see that's the, yeah that's really exciting we um uh, i failed to introduce myself so i'll just share for for some context i'm uh, i'm based in new york run a public private partnership that helps you know regional agencies in New York and New Jersey understand how technology uh, you know can improve public transit and not just understand. We find technology companies from around the world. We bring them to New York. We test you know tools that um, address critical challenges and then we deploy them. And 
bus schedules is one of those things that there historically is not a lot of flexibility around, tons of opportunity around, um, but it's a, you know, it, it it's it's one of those things that can create so much chaos because there's so much change and that's difficult to do in the public sector. Um, so are you are you sort of seeing that with Optibus there is you know there's just maybe more scenario planning there's just more scenarios that you're seeing kind of created yeah. from agencies? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, Charlotte, if anybody here's from Charlotte, we asked them this specific question: How many scenarios would they run with the service delivery change? And they would say one or two, because it took about four weeks to run a scenario plan to make sure it was union compliant and everything else. And it took them just minutes and hours with us. So they ran, I think, two, 229 different scenarios with different headway assumptions, different social distancing assumptions, uh, different cleansing times at the end of you know the terminal. And to balance all of those 16 or 17 different forces to get the right schedule, including the number one problem that we have in the transit industry, which is driver shortage. You not only have to produce a schedule that's rider friendly, but we will talk about this maybe later, but driver friendly as well, because there's a driver shortage here too. And that's a sort of a big issue across the board. Um, but one of the you know, holy grails is paper maps and the transit industry. Several of our agency partners said, you know what, we're going to use this pandemic as an example to get rid of paper maps. And it happened and people didn't show up at the council meeting and demand the mayor's resignation. And I think many of them are not going to be printing paper maps. One of the latest industries to finally get rid of paper-based maps. Um, not all of them, but many. And um, I think that's just a big win in terms of cost savings, moving fast, being able to you know, change your schedule more frequently. Because the marketing department, not the planning department, was often the bottleneck inside of agencies to bring out new schedules that better match the demand. Right. I mean, so, so far we have, you know, two great answers, right? We have, uh, you know, one, uh, a, a complete reframing of what role public transit has to play in, in, you know, serving uh, Angelinos. And then we have uh, the, the flexibility of creating multiple, multiple scenarios and dynamically offering different service changes, different times of the day, different times of the week um, to people across the U.S., uh, Ravi, tell us, uh, you know, from a data perspective, you've been working with uh, cities across the U.S. Um, to organize data, uh, uh, you know, organize it in such a way that it can be visualized to help operations planners make better decisions and to, you know, create, um, you know, uh, better service changes. Tell us about the work that, you know, that you've seen uh, agencies do maybe as it relate to, relates to data or as it relates to you know, your, your perspective with AWS? Sure, um, so post pandemic, we live in a very changed world and we work with the railroad operator where we use uh, IoT sensors within rail cars to detect occupancy. And then when you pair that up with LED lighting, that tells you which of those rail cars are red, green or yellow. Uh, for social distancing. So that's something that we did. Uh, within the perspective of Dallas area rapid transit, we implemented a contactless payment system um, because people were concerned about anything that would induce contact. And then from um, an operational excellence perspective, we have worked with Maryland Transit Administration uh, to improve their operational efficiencies, whether it's making their service on time, reliable, uh, efficient, and economic. So are you seeing that there's then a greater appetite for restructuring data sets in a way that, you know, they can be better used and analyzed across the agencies that you're collaborating with? Is that something that you're seeing? So um, I think one of the things uh, what we are starting to see as a trend is data is key to solving business problems. And there's a vast amount of data. There's an explosion of data, uh, whether it's through the, the customer journey through the transit service or uh, through the different personas that use the transit service. And what you need is that industrial capability that can capture this data, process this data, analyze this data, and spit out actionable insights. And this is where the cloud computing really uh, plays a huge role uh, because it allows you to build that industrial framework that's needed to process this information that's coming in. Um, and so within that context, uh, what we have is, Almost all of our customers, um, they express um, repeatedly that what they find is a differentiator with cloud computing is how reliable and how um, the uptime that we provide. So 
what that allows them to do is, okay, now you have all of this data. How can you make the customer journey uh, delightful, frictionless, um, and uh, as well as on the operational side, how do you introduce reliability, efficiency, and... Uh, right, so... I guess let me just dig into that for a second. Um, transit agencies are usually overwhelmed by the amount of data that they have access to. So, you know, more specifically, do, do does Amazon kind of come in and help them structure that data in a way that it can be better used? Is it sort of a consulting uh, and then, uh, you know, a structuring of the data and then, you know, partnering with kind of like an Optibus style partner to then visualize that data? Yes. So what AWS provides is the Lego building blocks. What you have is pre-built, uh, uh, evaluated, you know, there are customers using these Lego blocks and you get to go implement these Lego blocks, whether it's for um, capturing the data that's coming in, whether it's processing the data that's coming in. And so you don't have to introduce best practices. Uh, you're agile in your implementation. Um, and so you can have rapid turnarounds, whether it's for time to market, or time to value. Um, and that's what we start seeing. So we have started working with transit agencies that are looking to um, uh, take the, the fixed route service, combine that with the on-demand service and provide that single pane of glass. Typically those systems by themselves are inefficient, but we have partners that uh, derive efficiencies out of those systems. And how do you, so you could start off simple with something like paratransit, um, because it's a much smaller subset of data that you're working with, and then expand that out. So for a city like LA, which is a tourist magnet, um, how do you create a digital wayfinding app that's, um, that can support multiple languages, as well as you know, is legible and welcoming to visitors to the city? Um, and, and once you have that available, how do you translate that into a different form factor? In this case, uh, digital interactive kiosk powered by technology like Alexa. And now you have a solution that spans across multiple segments of the population. Very cool. Um, yeah, anecdotally, we worked on a project in New York uh, where we wanted to create a live subway map to your point, Kevin, you know, around, you know, having a live visual representation around what was actually happening in the system. And it took us, you know, about two years of working with engineers just to structure the data in such a way that would allow us to do that. But if anyone is interested, if you go to mta.map.info, you will see in real time where the subways are at each station, and it's a pretty cool feature. Um, so let's move on to maybe, uh, you know, speaking again practically about what has worked, maybe what hasn't worked. Is there are there any tools that you've you've worked on or? Uh, you know, on the product side or any projects that you've maybe implemented or that you're seeing in the market that are maybe not as practical or as effective in, in meeting customer needs? Um, Joshua. Well, so look, I mean, we've, we've had um, an unsolicited proposal process for the last five years that has allowed anyone with an idea for things that we should be doing to submit that idea. We had, we've had over 250 unsolicited proposals come through and a number of them have become actual projects at Metro like our Metro micro on-demand service, uh, like our the, the aerial tram we're building between Dodger Stadium Union Station. A lot of them are actual projects. I can tell you the ones that get rejected. <laughs> things that get rejected are typically things that are where, where people are very excited about the technology, but haven't thought through what it is that it will actually accomplish for our business model and for our customers. And that is the, the most critical uh, you know, mistake that I think, uh, I think people often make it's like you can have the greatest technology in the world, but if we can't make a business case for why it should be a part of Metro, uh, then it's, not, it's going to be hard enough to do the stuff that is a business case <laughs> that has it. it. We're certainly not going to be able to do an R&D effort. So just for as an example, you know, because I don't want to pick on any particular company, I will pick on a technology, which is autonomous vehicles. And the reason I'll pick on that is that we have been uh, pitched autonomous vehicle ideas uh, every year since I've been here, except that no one has actually submitted a real unsolicited proposal for, for an autonomous vehicle because there is no real mechanism by which we can use autonomous vehicles to accomplish our goals. They just aren't there yet as far as uh, serving mass transit in a meaningful way that either improves mobility or improves safety or improves something we actually care about. They're not there yet. So I think a good way to think about if you want to be part of the solution 
of, of getting through this and, and, and coming out of this in a better place is don't start with the technology, start with the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and then if the technology fits into that, that's great. But if you're stuck in the technology, you're probably not gonna be all that helpful. Probably a great tip for anyone trying to do business with a government entity. So thank well, you. I just wanna build on that because Joshua talked about technology. I'm talking about people. I think one of the things that hasn't worked in the pandemic is our, our transit agencies around the globe have really focused on riders, riders, riders. And now the three biggest problems they have are drivers, drivers, drivers. Recruiting drivers, there are 55,000 fewer drivers today, transit drivers, operators in North America than there were two years ago. And many of our agencies wanna provide, use our software, better service. They have the funds. We've helped them find that loose change in the cushions. They just can't find the operators to take the work. There's all sorts of incentives. I don't know what LA metros are, but paying for your commercial driver's license. Um, you know, there's concern for safety and, and the agencies have done a pretty good job, I would say with masks and protection and the like, but they're now just starting to do a better job of um, recruiting the part-timers by having late night shifts uh, that they can come in at four o'clock at night and reducing split shifts. And now finally, we're starting to see, we need to have schedules that are both rider friendly and driver friendly, not just union compliant, that's just table stakes but actually driver friendly to help you attain and retain and attract new drivers, especially with the infrastructure bill coming in. I think our transit agency customers will be flooded with cash, but now we need people to actually drive those because those autonomous buses aren't here yet. Um, and I think that's one of the things that didn't work was just too much focus on one of the constituents and people sort of forgot about the other people in the equation, in this case was the bus operators. So maybe just to, uh sit on Optibus for a second from a feature perspective um, or even from a data perspective. I'm sure you guys, uh, are, you know, gather or uh, feed data to optimize schedules or optimize, you know, kind of bus uh, uh, time performance. Um, are there any data feeds that you are seeing that have been particularly helpful, you know, in, in informing kind of like the product that, you know, the agencies are using or any data that's maybe not been particularly helpful? Yeah, well, you, you, there's two things that might be, seems to be a conflict. Sometimes there's too much data, but not enough information and insight, right? I use a traffic example where you care about traffic, but you really care about what's your ETA to LEX, LAX and what's my fastest route given traffic, right? The insight is what's my fastest route given uh, traffic. And, and the same thing here when we've got lots of origin destination data, but how do we actually apply it to Title VI and some of the actual goals that people have for transit deserts or un, you know, unprovided neighborhoods? So we can actually say, look at all those trade-offs and actually have the questions. And then back to the speed of scenario planning where you can actually now run those plans and looking at that data. So origin destination data is very valuable. Obviously you plan for a schedule, but then the rubber hits the road on the day of because drivers call in sick, but vehicles break. Um, and then an actual ridership actually varies from what you thought. And we're still now starting to feed these in on the actual to actually influence the predictive because there's sort of three lenses. There's planned, real time and historic and the historic can actually feed it. And then it's changing every three months. Like if, if any of you are here in Boston, right? You know, Boston hollows out in July and August because all the students go home and in September they come, but no one knows what's next year is gonna look like. And if you know what it looks like, then I, my suggestion is that you probably are gonna be wrong and come up here and actually guess. And I think I'll be wrong. And this is why my, my, my message to transit agencies is flexibility across the board, but take the data to your direct question and try to run it through these platforms. And there's some really cool platforms out in the exhibit hall there and turn it into data and insight that's actionable because you have to know the problem you're solving I find that even at night, sometimes I go down these rabbit holes and I end up with 15 tabs open in my browser because it's really interesting. And I was like, what was I trying to solve, right? And you, maybe you've all done that. So turn data into information and insight and try to keep as much flexibility as you can because whatever you think is true today won't be true tomorrow. Right, and, and maybe just going into the data question, Ravi, um... so, you know, it, the, the question is, you know, wh what is maybe, what's something that maybe is, I guess, you know, is working, but also is not working? Are there, are there sources or types of data that are not particularly useful that you see cities or, or agencies have, 
or that are not formatted in a particularly useful way for analysis or visualization? Do you have any sort of insights or tips around that? We take a different approach and I'm glad that Kevin called out whatever he called out because you have this real-time data that needs to be actioned upon. And our concept is, our philosophy is fail fast, learn, iterate, and move forward with incremental improvements. Because our end goal is we don't think about innovation as one big bang incident. We, we think about innovation as continuous improvement through the life cycle. So, so when you look at our software development methodologies, it's very agile. You're processing data, you're looking at data, you're uh, taking your assumptions and matching to see if your assumptions match that data. And then you quickly pivot and do what is necessary. So um, every agency that we have worked with, we start off with a minimum viable product you know, and a timeline. And one of the feedbacks that we constantly receive from almost all of these agencies is the time it took for them to use the cloud to move a concept into production is much shorter time frame than what it would take for them to go through the planning process with their on-prem implementation. And that's primarily how the cloud is the differentiator. So you be encourage failures because failures are the stepping stone to success. So another shifting gears, another question um, that I that I have for this crew is um, around the strategic role of public agencies versus the private sector. And this is you know particularly cool because we have both represented here. Um, Joshua, you spoke to this, you know, at, at the beginning that um, this has been a, a great opportunity to kind of rethink the role of public transit. Um, and what do you think is the role of kind of the public sector in providing public transit versus where are there opportunities for the private sector to kind of fill maybe last mile needs or micro mobility needs? Thank you. That's one of my favorite questions because uh, one of the one of the biggest issues that that public agencies have in partnering with the private sector is that both sides are a little unsure of what, what, what's their role. And, and I think it helps to kind of state what, what clearly, what, what, what does each side bring to the table? So here are some things the private sector is really good at. Uh, designing software, uh, coming up with new ideas, uh, making a profit, being incentivized to make a profit. Those are really important things uh, that, that lend themselves in many ways to public transit and to, to the larger opportunities if that's what they're coming in with. What does the public sector do well? Well, changing quickly is not one of those things, right? Um, writing our own software, not simply something we're gonna have a strength in, and taking the risk on new technology, not something we're really good at. Um, but what we are good at is looking out for larger public policy goals. That's actually our, our role, in, is to make sure that people aren't um, getting completely stampeded by the capitalist system we live in and, 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 and ensuring that, that we were, we're helping the people who need the help the most, making sure that we don't completely destroy the planet, uh, making sure that we aren't all using the roads at exactly the same time and thus uh, clogging them up and creating traffic. So that's what we should be doing. We're not always great at doing that, but that's our role in it. So an example of the kind of partnership that works is when we do things like our mobility on demand service, right, where we partnered with VIA, and now that's part of our Metro microservice with Rideco, but we partnered with VIA on a first last mile service. They provided the vehicles, they provided the algorithm, they were, were designing the service. That's stuff that the private sector is good at. What we did is we said, okay, here's how we're going to make sure that we serve people with disabilities. Here's how we're going to make sure we serve low income people. Here's how we're going to make sure we connect it to public transit and, it's, and, and make sure that it's part of the transit system. And then eventually that service became part of our food delivery service during the pandemic to needy families. So that's a good balance of, of the private sector and the public sector roles. And I, and I think it's, it, you're going to have a much more effective partnership when you think about it in terms of who can bring what to the table. Just another quick example is on our electric bus conversion, right? We're, we're, we're going to zero emission bus by 2030. Well, you might think, well, what, something we should do well is buses. Well, yes, but we've never actually run an electric bus system. And we don't have the knowledge and, uh, and experience to do that. So why should we take all the risk on figuring out how to do it when there are private sector companies out there that are willing to put up the money and, uh, and make the investment in the infrastructure and take some of that risk? Now, of course, they're going to want to make a profit in return. They're not doing it for free. But in the long run, it's going to be less expensive for us to let them take some of that financial risk in a public-private partnership than for us to take all the risk ourselves. So that's another good example of how uh, partnering with the private sector is all about allowing 
the party best able to manage a given component of the project, giving them that responsibility. Allocate risk to the party best able to manage it. You're going to be more successful. Thank you. Uh, and I, I actually want to come back to you because there are so many cool uh, projects that you've deployed over the past few years, one of which is Metro Micro, which I think is, is such a brilliant intersection of, of you know, public transit being uh, responsive to unique needs in specific areas of the city. So can you maybe speak to that? Yeah, I mean, so Metro Micro was an unsolicited proposal. And, uh, and the idea there is um, we can do better than just providing one kind of service, right? We, we provide buses, we provide trains. They're pretty much the same thing. It's like a big vehicle with a lot of people in it that runs along a, a, a certain line, right? But meanwhile, there's other services out there that are offering uh, on-demand service uh, and heavily subsidized by venture capitalists that are able to do something that's a much better customer experience. And so we were getting uh, eaten a lot, uh, alive by, by that, uh, those alternative services. And so we thought, well, there's got to be some publicly provided version of this that not only can uh, uh, compete effectively on certain routes with the private sector, but also can serve the people that the private sector is not serving effectively. And that's really, I think, what you're getting at, right, is that we didn't just go out there and say, okay, let's, let's put Uber out of business. We'll offer a highly subsidized Uber and, and, and kill it. No, that's, that wasn't the goal. The goal was, where are the people who are underserved? who need better service, who can't afford Uber and Lyft, who can't uh, uh, necessarily uh, use it because perhaps they're in a wheelchair and Uber and Lyft are, are difficult often for, for wheelchair users. Um, for, perhaps there's, uh, there's just not good uh, service in their area. Let's, let's find a way to serve those folks and let's do it as a publicly provided service that is responsive to the public sector needs while using the innovative uh, algorithm and, uh, and design that the private sector can provide. And that's what we did in, in our partnership with Rideco. And, and now we're operating on-demand services as part of our surface transportation system all around LA County. So if you Google Metro Micro, you will find the coolest app and you can get around certain areas of LA for $1, believe it or not. Um, so very, very cool example. Um, Kevin, what about what about you? Uh, you know, tell us what, what role can the private sector play in supporting public transit and the comeback, especially post pandemic. Well, I think Joshua said it really well. Risk is one, um, and shared learning across the globe. Not that transit agencies don't communicate, but again, we get to see 500 cities around the globe, and what we're seeing and happening in London or Singapore or Dubai might help us. You know, in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, you, you just don't know. So we get to bring out best practices. In fact, we, we now have several agencies who use our software for fixed route, asking us to work with companies like Rideco and Spare and Via and others to have one sort of platform with data where you can evaluate the cost, especially if you're using uh, shared vehicles that are owned by the city or drivers, to how do you actually take advantage? So often a driver, you might not know this at a risk of boring you, a driver will come in and do a, sh a shift in the morning. It's called a split and then sit at the break room and sort of do nothing and then do the afternoon shift. Well, they can run on demand in the middle of the day and you just get much more efficiency of your drivers. Uh, so this, this has been fantastic. The, the, invest, the investment into the on-demand space has been really strong this last two years. And there's a lot of really great companies and uh, we're trying to partner with them all. You, you know, LA Metro chose Rideco, other people are choosing Spare. There's, there's many of these out there. But to sit back holistically and say, how do I, as a facilitator to look after equity and on demand, run a real transportation network. I think if I had to back up, I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs is changing. When I went to school, Maslow's hierarchy of needs started with like food, shelter, or water. Then it changed a couple of years ago to power and Wi-Fi, right? For business executives, because we're all at the airport looking for power. But basic mobility and transportation is right at the bottom. And as I've talked to people this week, I'm really energized by the motion here of it's rail, it's transit it's small vehicles, it's bikes, it's scooters. How do we provide transit? And the definition of transit has changed over the last year to our riders. And the use case of going to the store just down the street is different than it is going to work or going to the airport. And I never used to hear a lot about use cases. And as we listen to our agencies now, they're talking about use cases versus a weekday schedule, a weekend schedule. And if they're innovative, they would have a Christmas and Thanksgiving schedule. 
right? Now they have lots of schedules and lots of driver groups from driver groups who are parents who need to be home by three o'clock to get the kids from school to retired drivers. And there's just a lot more flexibility that you can have to meet this ever-changing need when you've got tools and infrastructure. Again, we're an AWS customer. It allows us to do these iterations very quick. Our transit agency customers benefit because they don't have to build the software to run all these scenarios because scenarios are hard. They're not always perfect, but you want to be able to answer all those questions of can we afford it? Can we meet the transit deserts? Can we meet our equity analysis of Title VI? And there's a lot of challenges. And uh, again, flexibility. I'm really proud of a lot of our transit agencies who run multiple flexible schedules and have really started to play offense. If I can say one more thing there, I think over the last two years, despite risk adverse, many of our customers were sort of playing defense. Don't get me fired. And now many of them have turned over to, let's play offense. Let's actually go out there and actually provide a better service for our riderships and actually impress the mayor and the city manager and the CEO of the transit agency as opposed to someone hide from them because I don't want to get fired. That, that, that's a bit of an exaggeration for clarity, but we see it all the time around. And it's really as a person of the earth, not just as a software vendor, it's very invigorating because we all agree we need to provide better transit for our Maslow hierarchy needs of the 7 billion of us. Right, it's 2021, and most of the technology on the back end systems is still 1980. And now, with this infrastructure bill and others, we're seeing everyone upgrade their infrastructure and tools so that they can actually provide better services across the board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love the intersection of when the public sector and the private sector can come together to, to you know, have each part do what it does really well. You know, I think one one moment where we saw this early on for our work with, you know, with with New York and technology, um, we uh, we saw that the MTA was looking to do a bus network redesign, you know, to your point around kind of looking at, uh, you know, uh, bus networks that hadn't been reevaluated in 100 years, uh, you know, looking at things from scratch, looking at a map and trying to figure out how do you do this kind of from scratch and, um, and you know, having brilliant operational, uh, you know, planners uh, at the MTA, you know, really looking at uh, literally 200 pages of like stacked demographic information, you know, for the Bronx to try to make decisions. And then having, um, in our case, it was Remix come in. Uh, this is a software tool that makes, uh, you know, creating uh, different designs for bus networks really easy and, and you know, database and streamlined having them come in, train the operations planners for, you know, how to create, you know, a multitude of scenarios um, to really make that a faster, more efficient process and to make it so that we had better bus networks for, for New York. And it's, it's really incredible, the outcomes um, of an effective public-private partnership. But I think this is especially a huge need from a data perspective, right, Ravi? Because there's one thing that public agencies rarely have is really great engineering talent, right? There's a dearth of it in the private sector. There's especially a dearth of it in the public sector. It's really hard to hire for. It's very expensive, difficult to retain. Um, what role is AWS playing in, you know, kind of maybe serving this particular need, you know, and and uh, and maybe being a resource uh, for a, a, such a big area of need to the public sector? And where is the opportunity there? So we strongly believe in public-private sector partnerships. And I like what uh, um, Joshua had mentioned, which is we, we expect to put skin in the game. So when we run POCs, we fund those POCs uh, to an extent because our expectation is the success of the POC has a bearing on both the agency that we are working with as, as well as AWS and the partners that we bring to the table. That would be one aspect. The other aspect is something called working backwards from the customer. So that's one of Amazon's leadership principles. And what we are trying to do is continually use customer feedback for each of our services to improve what the roadmap looks like. So if you look at our service roadmap, 90% of that is driven by customers, public sector, private sector. And it's a collaborative effort in terms of improving the overall product. Um, the best example that I can give you is um, traffic signal timing. Traffic signals, for the most part, worked on fixed timing. And what we are looking to do is uh, modify that signal timing to be much more adaptive based on multimodal transport. We also work with connected vehicles. Now you have connected buses 
that might be running behind schedule, you have this opportunity of modifying. So we layer our POC efforts wherein we see what's working in one area and then try to pair that up with ideas from other agencies and how that could be beneficial. So, so we, we, when we talk about partnerships, we are talking about growing that ecosystem of services that agencies require and then introducing the right partners to enable that. Great. So, um, you know, we, we have a few more minutes left and uh, I'll leave about 15 minutes for Q&A and would love to hear from each of you about, you know, the things that you're interested in, um, you know, your perspectives, the things that you're kind of seeing and how public transit is bouncing back and, you know, the role of the public and private sector. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious just as one kind of set of last round, um, one last round question is, is there any tool or product or project that you're either seeing in the market or you're deploying soon that you think um, you know has a real chance of having you know a big impact in in improving public service. Yeah, so uh, one of the exciting things we're working on, and this was discussed at, or is being discussed in another panel. I'm not sure when it is, but that the the woman who's leading the service is going to talk about it. Um, is our uh, our travel rewards pilot, which is a really exciting. So we we have a we're working on congestion pricing pilot. It's called traffic reduction study, where we're looking at how we can toll uh, roads in LA County and reduce congestion and generate revenue for public transit. But we're also working on the other side. The other side of that is can we pay people not to drive alone, right? Which is a really interesting concept because there's too many people driving alone. That's the fundamental problem in Los Angeles that causes all the traffic and creates the inequities and creates the mobility challenges and creates the pollution and all the problems that we know is because too many people drive along, right? So one side of that is, well, start charge, charging people for driving. And the other side of that is incentivize people not to drive alone. What we're doing is we're working with partners um, at uh, businesses around LA County who want to incentivize their folks to not drive alone. And one of the great things about the pandemic, lots of horrible things, lots of some mediocre things, some great, one great thing is that we have all realized that we don't actually have to drive to work every single day. And so one of the options in the toolbox for uh, getting people not to drive alone is of course that they don't take the trip at all. Um, that's one, but that's not the only one. There's also, you can carpool, you could bike, you could walk, you could take transit. Um, and the idea is to put the incentives uh, out there for people to think about sh shifting, because one of the things we learn from social psychology, and the, re the reason we're doing this, in fact, with social psychologists at Duke University, is that one of the things we learn about in the times like this, the pandemic, is that this is an inflection point in people's minds where they are somewhat more open to change than they might otherwise be in their daily lives. So I, I, I'm sure you all experienced this, where before the pandemic, we're just like, yeah, uh, we go to work every day and we travel around and we're maniacs and that's just how life is. And then now we're all like, oh, maybe we don't have to do that all the time. Uh, maybe we can uh, live and see our children more and be at home and, and that's not so bad either, right? And so that opportunity presents uh, the, the chance to say, okay, maybe now we don't have to, not only we don't have to go to a full work every day, but maybe I don't have to just think that driving is the only way to get there and driving alone is the only way to get there. Let's present people with other options and provide them with rewards if they're willing to take those other options. Very cool. Kevin? Well, that's a trick question for me because I'm going to say obviously Optibus, but I won't do that because uh, we think we're obviously the best tool that's changing the industry. So I, I'm, I'm going to pick that aside. And I think the best, I'll say data, thing that's changed is real-time data. In, in the, it, I don't think this is actually a transportation problem. In many cases, it's a data problem. It's a it's a real time data problem. And users are getting used to seeing their Uber, or their pizza. If you haven't ordered a Domino's pizza, order Domino's pizza from your phone. Domino's is turning into an information company. It's not just dough and tomatoes and sausage. It's an information company, and they're differentiating their product based on people watching their pizza be boxed, cut, delivered. And it's amazing. It's you it's, have it's, to eat it. Is that it's addictive? Yeah, they'll actually. But it's, I think we have an information problem um, and everybody wants full access to human knowledge on their hand all the time. And it is 2021, that's not an unfair expectation. Where's my bus? Where's my scooter? Where's my bike? Where's my Uber? Right now, I wanna know right now because I'm making a million different decisions. And I think therefore the category, and I'll give a shout out to some of the partners, not my company, is real-time data. 
Real-time data is practically available everywhere now. And the space that's most innovating is what's called CAD ABL, um, Computer Aided Dispatch Automatic Vehicle Location. And there's some really cool companies in, the, in this area. Synchromatics is here for those of you who might be there. Uh, I don't know what stock in their company, the shout out for them, another company called TripShot. The cost of reduction in a sort of BYOH model, bring your own hardware. If I could do a little bit of a tailwind analogy, which is, a, I think that's a Jeff Bezos term for you, Ravi. Um, airlines have moved away from providing seatback entertainment systems and telephones to just giving you power and Wi-Fi because they believe in this model called BYOH, bring your own hardware. And I think transit agencies are doing that as well. Like I used to blink my, I'm gonna tell you how old I am. I used to blink my headlights driving on the highway to, uh, you know, tell people there's a cop behind me or a, you know, a deer on the road. And it was, it was a nice gesture. And now I share my GPS data with every one of you so that you know what the road colors. So we all know what the ETA to the airport is. And you know, when you click I allow on your phone, you probably know that you're not honestly sharing your GPS and it all helps everybody. The same thing I think is happening in transit. Yes, we need to write disclosure, but I would love to help my fellow colleagues know where the bus is or how full it is. It's a little bit embarrassing right now that every rider doesn't know exactly how full the bus is. And five years from now, we'll come back and say, remember when we were commotion 2021 and we didn't know how full every bus is? It was just, where is my bus versus how full it is? And I think those are the technologies. So the short answer is real-time data is my favorite new tool to enable that. Yep. Can I just res respond to that? Because like, I, I, I agree with you. And I 100% agree that we need to have that information. The question is, when it comes to priorities, is that the top priority? And because we've been approached, we were approached during the pandemic, like people said, look, people need to know how full the bus is. Let's get that information out there. Let's put it out there. And, and our operations and IT folks were like, yeah, that's good. But ultimately, our business model is getting as many people onto this bus as we possibly can. Do we really want to be in the business of giving them this information and spending resources and time to get them that information? So I would just put that back to you. Like, say, yeah. What do you say to transit agencies well, when they say that? I, I get it. Uh, almost every industry, though, more information is better than less. People used to say about well, restaurant reviews. Do I want restaurant reviews? And people actually, besides McDonald's, I guess you don't need a who's, who's reviewing McDonald's because they have a pretty good standard of quality for what they do. But People love restaurant reviews, and there's very few industries that I can think of where more information about a service is worse. And transparency. There used to be an old adage in the medical industry that doctors will get off their knees when patients uh, get off their uh, doctors will get off their pedestals when patients get off their knees. And that's what's happened with Wikipedia and others. And for those of you, you know, talking to your medical professionals, the relationships that you have with your medical provider now are substantially better than they were two years ago. But that argument used to be played, Josh, was we don't want our patients questioning the surgeon, right? And we just want them to be little children. We pat them on the head. So maybe that's the wrong analogy, but almost every industry wants that. And five years from now, when that is a relevant, uh, a common service provided, we'll look back and say, remember when we used to go and catch the bus and we didn't know how full it was? And we used to walk backwards both ways and share a mitten with our brother, right? So um, I, I have a position on that one. Yeah. So uh, we have all of this real-time data that's being captured. And what you can do, which is what Amazon does, is build personas out of that data that's being collected. And when you have personas um, that are being established through that data, you can also target personalization associated with that personas. Uh, because our assumption is each persona's behavior is going to be different. You'll never have a one-to-one -one mapping with every transit user, but you can as well build that persona that would be applicable. And what would be the things that would be relevant to that persona is where I would focus as a transit agency. Yeah, I'm sure Joshua, LA Metro must have the data in terms of understanding what are the use cases for bike usage and scooter usage and really understand those use cases in many cases, it's not getting to work and back. It's doing something else. And then you can oh, tailor yeah. the services. You know, that's a, our entire network is being restructured right now with the uh, idea that uh, work trips are not the centerpiece of where our future market share is, in fact. The, it, that, it, that was true before the pandemic, and it's especially true now. Yeah. Well, I might just have to explain to my doctor why I'm eating Wi-Fi, <laughs> according to the new Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, all right. Well, I, I think we can open it up to questions. If you have a question, I believe there are two microphones here in the middle. Feel free to, you know, just step right up and we'll, we'll take your questions. Someone approaching the podium, we'll give them a second. 
my name is Gretchen Noop. I'm, I'm with Mobility Data. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Um, Mobility Data is a nonprofit organization that actually you're touching upon a lot of the data that we build. We build and improve upon the data primarily for the traveler experience and are essentially building and maintaining the data pipeline that's used for the de facto standards worldwide, GTFS probably familiar with that. Most of you have accessed it. Many of the companies you've, organ you've mentioned today are actually are part of our community or our members. So I'm really interested in talking about how you're enhancing the traveler's experience because we focus on traveler behavior by providing high quality data through data validators, schemers, also improving the specifications. We do GTFS Flex, RideCo, as well as um, Remix are on our um, working group for our GOFS on demand development right now. So I'm really interested in talking about how you see the public private sector's role in building and maintaining this pipeline that's so important and critical to the ecosystem's growth worldwide. It's a great question. Well I'm, Let me just a quick ahead. answer. Standards are hugely important. Look at every industry that's taken off VHS wars versus beta wars versus electricity. It, it keeps the cost down for technology vendors like us, which keeps the cost down for our, our partners. So standards like GTFS and others, even if they're not perfect, there's risks of adopting standards too early, right? We all live with the QWERTY keyboards. We understand that example, but standards are hugely important that don't drive transit agencies nuts with having different infrastructure and costs that rise. So the work that you guys are doing is just fantastic. We as vendors have an obligation to help shape those standards, especially real time and flex as you've talked about. But I, I can't imagine where we'd be without GTFS in this industry right now. GTFS is the lifeblood of shared data across all of these ecosystems. But let me maybe suggest there's two sort of paradigms that are happening in our world. There are some vendors who provide a single throat to choke, a single platform from end to end, and there's others that are doing best of breed. Um, and I hope the best of breed wins because I'm glad I have a, a Dell laptop or a Mac and I have an HP printer, I have an Apple iPhone, and I'm glad I don't have to buy a, a Dell iPhone, for example. But in that example of best of breed, assumes data interoperability and standards. And we all just take HTML for, stand, for granted. We take HTTPS for granted and for those technologies in the web, for example. And standards like you guys are leading and helping govern, for lack of better words, are critical to keep our costs down, which means his costs are down, which means the level of service they can provide is paramount. Is, is that your question? Did we get it or we missed it? No, that's it. That's pretty much it, because we work across the whole ecosystem. We work with Cal ITB integrating, because we work, our two goals are high quality data for information, as well as integration of that data. So you can provide interoperability and seamless information. But um, as a nonprofit organization, we are open sourced. However, we need resources for building. And then what's really important and critically, as you said, a standard has to stick around to scale an industry. So the maintenance of that standard. So I'm curious from a P3 perspective, who, like you said, we do save revenue in-house, who covers that? Who, how is that supported within across the public private sector? So that is my question, what your perspective is on that. Well, we're big fans of open data. I've actually heard some of my colleagues in the industry talk about it being our data as a vendor uh, sort of like the Facebook model where you're, you're, we're going we're to have a network effect and get all of the economy scale versus it's your data, dear LA Metro, LA DOT. Uh, so we're on this camp of open data because we want innovation to happen. We can't do it by ourselves. There's innovation that happens. Josh talked about it in his organization across EVs, across uh, so many areas we can't even forecast. I just can't see open data not winning. I'm old enough to remember when people said Wikipedia won't beat Encarta. Do you guys even remember what Encarta was? In fact, I looked it up the other day on Wikipedia to know they went broke in 1982, right? But an army of ants can outrun any single proprietary company in most use cases. Maybe operating systems for PCs when people didn't understand this is an exception. But I think my forecast is in the transit industry, open data will win best of breed solutions will win. And when you got companies like Josh being able to take some risk of working with some vendors who might not perfectly work together and then maybe getting a stick and pounding us on the head when we don't quite work well enough together will be the way the industry will go. Joshua, any additional perspectives? 
Well, I think that's that's largely right, and and I think your your open data concept or the open data concept is where we've been going. I mean, that's that's more and more where we've been going. There's no there's not really much value in uh, in trying to hoard it, uh, as you've as you've said, and then try to sell it to everybody. There's way more value in being collaborative and putting it out there and working together to find solutions. And that's that's the approach we've been taking. Great. Um, maybe we'll have time for two more questions and we'll try to keep our answers to about a minute or so we, so we can take them both. A quick question about data. One of the issues from a consumer point of view that's come up in LA has to do with um, proposed transit shelters that would capture rider or passers-by data and information uh, and how that would be stored and how people could opt in, opt out. And granted that that transportation arm provide, providers aren't really data managers. There are concerns about confidentiality and security. So I'm wondering how that's being addressed in the field. Uh, we also know now that digital billboards can capture data as well. So um, there's a, a conflict, the need for data, and yet the insecurity and the concern that people are now going to be tracked. I just give a one-line answer that in technology, so we've learned our lessons from other industries before. Um, and I, I think most of the fellow companies that we work with understand that and want to make sure all the data is completely anonymized. It, it's, it's for the public good to know how many people are left sitting at a bus shelter because they couldn't get on because the bus was full or how bus, how full the bus was. And I think back to the, you know, we've done this with traffic. We've done this with Wikipedia. We've done this with so many different technologies. And most people that are at the circle of the table that I'm on are in that camp where there's no one who's trying to make a business model based on knowing that it's actually Mary Smith at the bus stop, as opposed to there were two people left at the bus stop and we need to figure out how to provide two more trips there. You said the official Metro answer is we're never going to collect data unless people are opting in very clearly, like on our travel rewards program or, or anything like that. Uh, my personal uh, opinion is that if we think we're, we're living in a world that where our data is anonymous, we're uh, living in fiction because the reality is that <laughs> your data is out there and people are using it all the time to sell you things if you haven't noticed already. So uh, I, I doesn't mean that as a public agency, we're going to uh, you know, throw your data around. We're going to be very careful with it, but that's not unfortunately the case for the private sector. And we have one last question. Thanks. Uh, I'm Paul Salama from Clear Road. Um, hello. Um, so uh, it's interesting that you give the examples of Remix and Via because you know in the um, you know, innovations that you guys ran, um, this is their those companies' second, third, fifth business line. So you know they already have an established business, um, and then then they have the power, they have the kind of runway to be able to to work with government. Um, I guess the question is, what potentially are you missing uh, in potential solutions when you kind of rely on companies that already have other businesses and maybe there's um, some ideas that are not making their, uh, or I guess as a startup, I can't tell you the number of times that investors have said, don't work with government, that's too hard. You do find something, something else. Joshua, do you want to take this one? <laughs> I would say you got to work with the right government. Um, work, look, working with government is super hard. I am so sympathetic. I, I, I can't tell you, uh, you know, it's hard enough working within government uh, when you're on the private sector side, trying to work with within a morass of an agency like Metro. We got 11,000 people and, and each department has their own priorities and they're all fighting with each other about what happened. I mean, it's really tough. So I get it. Um, I would say that there are um, some government agencies that have made a concerted effort to try to create um, a, a conduit, a, a, a regular conversation with the private sector where ideas are coming in and they're being thoughtfully considered. Um, and that there is some mechanism by which we, we were able to consider those ideas. That's what we've done at Metro. And I think we've done it relatively successful given the size of our organization and the tendency against change. I think we've made tremendous progress, but yeah. You have. It's hard. You, you've done it's a really hard. good job. You really have. No, seriously. <laughs> no, thank you. And I would just add, uh, you know, in New York, for companies that are interested in working in New York, um, you know, we have a 
tools. I mean, we have the traditional procurement processes, of course, but we also have tools um, available to uh, startups that, you know, don't have a clear path to working through, you know, traditional RFPs by applying to Transit Tech Lab challenges. We have one coming out Q1 2022. Um, and, uh, and, you know, to be fair to the public sector, the public sector is not where we want to um, explore untested, unproven ideas. We want all our, we will all want our tax dollars to be well spent. And we usually want our tax dollars to be spent on, you know, proven tools that are going to improve public services. And so, you know, I, I would generally say that you know, companies that are ready to work with the public sector and that have, you know, proven tools that can address, you know, critical challenges can generally find, you know, a, a champion that can kind of you know, see if there is there there. Um, so the Transit Tech Lab, uh, the Urban Mobility Lab, and the Office of Extraordinary Innovation in, in LA, um, uh, and and you know. Uh, there's, 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 if there's a great product, I would say that there's a way is, is kind of the last thing I would say. Um, so we're at time. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you to our panelists for great thoughts and conversation. Thank you.